All right, we're diving into Klausowitz again today. Back into On War. But we're tackling something a little different this time. Something absolutely critical, though. I mean, you can't really have war without it, right? Exactly. Even if it doesn't get as much glory as the battles themselves. Right, the planning, the tactics. Today we're getting into the nitty-gritty of how armies sustain themselves. The food, the supplies, all the stuff that keeps a military force going. Which Klausowitz digs into in Book 5, Chapter 14. And it's not just about, like, what soldiers eat. It's about the whole system of how those supplies are gathered, transported, and frankly, how those logistical realities shape a military campaign. Because they really do. I mean, think about it. Armies on the move, they need a constant flow of food, water, ammunition. Not to mention all the other stuff. Oh, absolutely. The medical supplies, replacement equipment, all of it. Mm -hmm. And if that flow is disrupted or worse, cut off entirely, the whole war effort can grind to a halt. Which is why Clausewitz thought this was so important. He was writing in the 19th century. Right? right. And warfare was undergoing some massive changes at that time. Oh, absolutely. We're talking about a shift from those smaller feudal armies to these large professional state-funded militaries. So instead of, like, a bunch of knights showing up for a battle and then going home. Yeah. You have these massive armies operating over huge distances and for much longer periods. Exactly, and that changes everything. Because suddenly you're not just raiding a few villages for food. No, not even close. You've got tens of thousands of men who need to be fed and supplied day in and day out, and not just for a few weeks. We're talking months, years even. So how do you keep up with that? Well, that's what Klausowitz breaks down for us. He lays out four main methods that armies use to get what they need, living off the inhabitants, exactions, requisitions, and magazines. Let's start, I guess, with that first one, living off the inhabitants. Sounds a little ominous. It could be, but it's not always as simple as it sounds. Klausowitz, he was a pretty analytical guy, and he recognized that there's a kind of science to it. Science to basically taking what you need from the local population. Well, it's more nuanced than just that. He talks about understanding the carrying capacity of a region. Carrying capacity, meaning? Meaning how much food and resources you can realistically draw from an area without completely destroying it or turning the people against you. So there are limits. Absolutely. You can't just bleed an area dry and expect it to keep producing. Close of it's he stresses that you have to think about things like, well, how dense is the population? Makes sense. More people, more food. Right. And what kind of agriculture exists? Are we talking fertile farmland or more uh, arid regions? Even things like the transportation networks matter. Because if you can't move the supplies efficiently... Then they're useless. And what's really interesting, I think, is how Klausowitz highlights the importance of the relationship between the army and the civilians. Because if they're the ones growing the food... Exactly. You can't just strong arm them all the time. Living off the inhabitants, it requires at least some level of cooperation, some attempt to not completely alienate the population. So it's a delicate balance. You need the resources, but you don't want to create more enemies in the process. Which is where things can get tricky because, let's face it, war is messy. And that's where Klauswitz's second method comes in, which he calls exactions. Exactions. It's basically when troops have to go out and secure their own supplies. So less uh, asking politely, and more. Let's just say it's not always a pretty picture. We're talking foraging parties, requisitioning food and supplies, often with, well, let's just say, little regard for property rights. I can see how that could backfire, especially if you're trying to win over the local population. Exactly. And Klausowitz, he acknowledges this. He says exactions are kind of a double-edged sword. How so? On the one hand, they can give you a certain level of self-sufficiency, especially for, let's say, smaller units operating ahead of the main force. They need to be able to grab what they need on the go. Sure, they can't exactly wait for a supply train to catch up. But on the other hand, exactions are incredibly disruptive, they're prone to abuse, and as you pointed out, can very quickly alienate the local population. So, not exactly a recipe for long-term success. It seems like Klausowitz is pushing us towards a system, I don't know, maybe a little more organized, something that balances the army's need for resources, but also, I guess, tries to maintain some level of order. I think you're spot on. And that's where his third method comes in, requisitions. 
this is where we start to see a more, I guess you could say, a more systematic approach to how militaries get what they need. Okay, so less smash and grab, more. More like, well, there are procedures. You go through channels. You work with, or at least attempt to work with, the local authorities to get the supplies you need. So less about just taking what you need and more about... Requesting it or demanding it, maybe, but there's a process. It's about imposing some kind of order on the whole chaotic business of extracting resources in the middle of a war. So instead of just you know, showing up and taking what they want, now there's paperwork. Well, maybe not always paperwork, but definitely procedures, chains of command. Think of it almost like, well, I guess you could call it wartime bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. That doesn't exactly sound like a recipe for speed and efficiency, which seems kind of important in war. It does, doesn't it? And Klausowitz points that out, too. He says that requisitions, they work best when you've got time on your side. Because? Well, you need time to establish those procedures, mm -hmm. right? to figure out who's in charge, to get a sense of what resources are actually available. It all takes time. Which makes sense if you're, say, defending your own territory, you probably got a better handle on what you've got and who to talk to. Exactly. But if you're on the offensive, pushing deep into enemy territory. Time is the one thing you probably don't have. Exactly. And that creates this inherent tension, right? Because on the one hand, you need to move fast, seize the initiative, keep the enemy off balance. But the further you push, the more stretched those supply lines become. And the more you have to rely on what you can grab along the way, which takes us back to those exactions we were talking about. Exactly. And that's a dilemma that military commanders have faced for centuries. I mean, even Napoleon, probably one of the greatest military minds of all time. Even he had to deal with this problem. Oh, absolutely. His armies were famous for their speed, their maneuverability, but that also meant they were heavily reliant on living off the land. Which, as we've discussed, has its risks. Big time. And for Napoleon, it worked brilliantly for a while. I mean, his campaigns in Italy, in Germany, they were incredibly successful. They were able to move fast, live off the land, and just keep the pressure on the enemy. But that didn't last forever, did it? Nope. And Russia is the perfect example of how quickly things can fall apart when you outrun your supply lines. Because they tried the same thing in Russia, right? They did. But Russia is different. It's vast. The weather's brutal. And the Russians they knew how to make life difficult for invaders. Scorched earth. Exactly. Burn everything they can't carry, leave nothing for the enemy to use. And it worked. Napoleon's army, they marched into Russia, but they weren't prepared for a prolonged campaign in those conditions. And they basically starved, froze. Well, and it broke them. Which brings us to Klausowitz's fourth method of keeping an army fed, magazines. Which are? The old school way of doing things. Pre-positioned supply depots. You set up these big storehouses of food, ammunition, everything an army needs. So like the Walmart of military logistics. Kind of, but incredibly expensive to set up and maintain. And of course, they're a huge target for the enemy. Because if you can knock out your enemy's supply depot. You can cripple their entire war effort. And as warfare evolved, became more about maneuver, about speed, about striking quickly and decisively. Those big static supply dumps became more of a liability than an asset. Right. I mean, imagine trying to lug all those supplies around with you as you're trying to outmaneuver the enemy. Not exactly practical, is it? So where does that leave us? Klausowitz. He recognized that there's no one-size-fits-all solution here. The best approach, it depends on a whole bunch of factors. The terrain, the enemy, your overall strategic goals. But what's really important, I think, is his emphasis on understanding the interconnectedness of all of this. Interconnected. He's saying that logistics, they're not just about bean counting and supply lines. They're about understanding how an army interacts with the environment it's operating in. So like understanding the terrain. Absolutely. But also the resources, the people. He argues that it's far easier to sustain an army in a wealthy, densely populated region. Because... More people mean more food, more resources that can be diverted to the war effort. More infrastructure, too, like roads and bridges, which are essential for moving supplies around. Whereas if you're fighting in, say, the desert. Good luck finding a banquet laid out for you. You're going to have to bring everything with you, which puts a huge strain on your logistics. So what you're saying is that even today, with all our technology, our drones, our smart bombs... Geography still matters. And so does logistics. Absolutely. Klausowitz, he was writing almost 200 years ago, but the lessons he was laying out, they're as relevant today as they were back then. It's not just about having the best weapons or the most brilliant strategy. You've got to be able to sustain the fight. And that means understanding these logistical realities. It means adapting to the challenges of supplying an army in a complex and ever-changing world. And it means never forgetting the human cost of all of this. Because 
Behind all the maps, all the strategic planning. Are real people. Men and women who are putting their lives on the line. And if we fail to meet our obligations to them, if we fail to provide them with the support they need to do their jobs. Then we're failing them and our mission in a very real and profound way. And Klaasowitz, he doesn't shy away from that. He talks about the impact of logistical failures, not just in terms of like lost battles or campaigns. But the human toll? Exactly. He describes the exhaustion, the hunger, the plummeting morale, the increase in disease, desertion. The things that break an army, not from the outside, but from within. And that's a really powerful reminder, I think, because it's easy to get caught up in the strategic level, the big picture. But wars are fought and won by people. And people have limits. They do. And good leaders, they recognize those limits. They understand that a well-supplied soldier, a well-fed soldier, is a more effective soldier. Absolutely. And that investing in logistics, it's not just about bean counting, it's an investment in victory itself. So when we think about Klausowitz, we often focus on his ideas about strategy, about the nature of war itself. But this chapter, it highlights a different dimension of his thinking. A more practical side, but no less important. I mean, he's really pushing us to think beyond those tactical considerations, to see the bigger picture. To recognize that even the most brilliant military plan is useless if you can't keep your troops supplied, if you can't sustain the fight. And that's a lesson that's as relevant today as it was back in Klausowitz's time, maybe even more so. Because in some ways, the logistical challenges have only gotten more complex, right? Oh, absolutely. Think about the distances involved in modern military operations. We're talking about projecting power across continents, relying on these incredibly complex supply chains that stretch across the globe. And we're not just talking about food and ammunition anymore. No, we're talking about fuel, spare parts, medical supplies, and don't even get me started on the need for like constant communication, the bandwidth demands of a modern military. It's mind-boggling. It's like the technology, it's changed everything, but in some ways it's just made logistics even more important. Exactly. And then you've got the whole challenge of non-state actors, insurgents, terrorist groups, they don't have to play by the same rules. They've often weaponized their lack of traditional logistical needs. They're mobile, they're adaptable, and they can exploit the vulnerabilities of those long, often very fragile supply lines that we rely on. It's like they've flipped the script on us, right? So what do we do? Well, I think that's where Klausowitz's emphasis on adaptability, on understanding those interconnected factors, that's where it becomes even more crucial. Because we can't just rely on having the biggest supply depots or the fastest trucks. Nope. We've got to be smarter, more agile. We've got to be able to anticipate those challenges, to adapt our logistical strategies on the fly. And that's what makes Klauswitz so valuable even today. He's not giving us a blueprint. He's giving us a framework. He's giving us the tools to think critically about these challenges, to question our assumptions. And to never, ever lose sight of that human dimension. Because in the end, wars are fought and won, not by machines or logistics, but by people. People who deserve our best, both on the battlefield and off. That's it for our deep dive today. Until next time.